Hello, everyone, and welcome again to another episode of Resilient Health Radio. I'm your host, Dr. Darren Ingalls, and joining me on the podcast today is someone I just have mad respect for, truly a leader in functional medicine, biotoxin illness. Uh, she is the author of Unexpected and the feature of a new documentary called uh, Dr. Patient. So Dr. Jill Carnahan, welcome to the podcast. so much, Dr. Deer, and I'm excited to be here with you. You know, I, of course, one of the great joys of doing this is I get to talk to people I know and I say I respect and, you know, you've got such a, an interesting <laughs> story that I, I know you've shared before, but I think for people who aren't familiar with you and don't know, I mean, you've been through a lot. I mean, we all have our trials and tribulations. I mean, that's life, right? But it's it's almost like God put a lot of obstacles in your way to get you to where you are today. Uh, but it's incredibly inspiring because you've you've learned not just as a doctor, but as a patient to yeah. overcome these obstacles. Can you just, you know, tell people a little bit about, you know, how your life kind of proceeded and what led you to do what you do today? Oh, thank you for that um, intro. Yeah, it's so interesting because I would have never known that. Um, I think the calling of a healer, any healer, is to suffer to some extent because we really truly learn at those levels. And there's no amount of textbook knowledge that we could ever get that is equivalent to the experiential um, issues that we do. So I grew up on a farm in central Illinois, one of five children. My mother was a retired nurse to raise us. We had a like half acre garden. So I grew up with very deep respect for the soil and for the uh, food and for food as medicine. And even though I wouldn't have, I never even knew the term integrative medicine when I was growing up, the principles of the fact that we till the soil and we grow our produce. And we, again, we certainly bought stuff from the grocery store too. And I saw regular doctors, but in general, it was a very holistic kind of upbringing. And so that gave me a deep respect for the body's ability to heal. And then um, as I'm looking in, in uh, high school, what kind of career do I want to go into? And at that time, physical therapy was really popular. And I knew I kind of wanted to more, my mentor as growing up had been a chiropractor. So I had deepest respect for the um, other fields other than just allopathic medicine, because he really taught me about nutrition and about wellness. And he was kind of our family, almost family physician. So deepest respect for all of that. And when I applied, I looked at chiropractic and acupuncture. And then finally, kind of as a last minute thing, I thought, well, maybe I go try to apply to medical school, like allopathic medicine. And what I realized um, was that was the first part of my journey as a healer, because I always say I kind of infiltrated because so much of what's taught in allopathic medicine with just drugs and surgery and not root cause medicine, it really goes against what I believe. But I thought, what if I could learn this and try to pull these worlds together and be a voice of science and reason in a field that doesn't always look at root cause? And I started to realize I had this role as this person who can maybe bridge, like be someone who stands on good science and brings good research, but also opens the minds and hearts of those who are practicing conventional medicine, because all of us go into medicine to really solve problems and help patients. And when right. all we do is seven minute visit, write a prescription, um, we lose that joy. And I've seen this over and over again, we don't have the joy. So a lot of docs out there are getting burned out and frustrated. And part of the journey, as you mentioned, is 25 years old, third year medical student, I got a sudden found a lump in my breast and ended up getting a diagnosis of aggressive breast cancer at 25. And to put this in perspective, a lot of women, the average age of diagnosis is 55. It's often more slow growing. It can be life-threatening at any age, but in a 20 something, it's a death sentence. I was in a group of women under 40 and I'm the only one still living. So it's just, wow. it was shocking. And in my medical school, Loyola, at that time, about 20 years ago, I was the youngest one they had ever diagnosed. So kind of an anomaly. Now, in hindsight, that was the start of my journey as a true healer, because I had to live this, I had to figure out how to overcome it. And I had to go really, really deep in the suffering. And what I've found in that was there's meaning and purpose at the most dark and difficult times in our lives. And honestly, more than any pill or supplement or thing that I could bring to patients, the thing that I think is most powerful in healing is hope and in believing that there is a way out of the most difficult circumstances. Wow. <laughs> I'm sure the, the shock at the time must have been quite overwhelming, you know, and of course, having this medical knowledge, you know, I, I said, I, I, I'd say as a whole, and I'll, I'll be the first to admit it, doctors as a whole, we're usually terrible patients, right? You know, we know too much. We question everything. We have a hard time trusting other doctors. You know, how, do, how did you kind of 
take that that perspective as a doctor and say, wow, I mean, I know what I know, but to be able to just even you know, reach out and trust other people for your care. Yes, this is this was hard because I a couple of things I think are real important points for the listener if they're dealing with a difficult diagnosis or especially cancer can be like this. I was in med school. I was, at, you know, I had the best access to the libraries and journals. And that was the time before all the, like we could Google a little bit. You know, but pre-internet. Like, <laughs> yeah, you still went to the library and to looked at articles. And I remember for days and days, I would pull out the articles on breast cancer treatments and try to figure it out. And what I wanted to say was, we always think going to the doctor, there's a black and white answer. Like, here's the, yeah, here's what you do. And here's the studies. The truth is most parts of medicine, and I would say, especially chronic complex things that we deal with like um, Lyme disease and uh, mold related illness, they, these are not black and white. And what I realized very quickly in this journey was even the diagnosis of breast cancer was so far from black and white, everything was shades of gray. One of the big ahas was they told me, you know, if you either get a mastectomy or you get lumpectomy with radiation. And as I'm going through that, my left side was affected. So the radiation would go through um, to the left breast and actually affect the heart. So I knew there'd be heart damage, even in the best situations, because you can't completely avoid that. Right. And so I'm asking them about the side effects and I ask them, okay, what's the increase in mortality? Meaning how much longer does someone live if they get lumpectomy plus radiation? At that time, the research said zero increase in mortality like zero improvement. I was like, well, why would I do that? <laughs> you know, like, and these questions like, well, you get um, an average of three more months of, of living, not, you know, like, so all these things came to play as far as the data really didn't support this. Some of this, And I ended up having a type of radiation. So I did do that. But these things that you think are black and white, when you start to ask the questions, it is so gray. And I thought if the average patient doesn't have a medical education, like I do and access to the library, how in the world can they possibly make good decisions or how can they not feel overwhelmed? And I had the deepest understanding at that moment of the amount of overwhelm the average patient faces. And especially nowadays when there's things coming, we just talked about it. There's so many influences out there and there's so many wonderful people giving good information, but there's also a lot of people who don't really have any business giving medical advice out there and they maybe have a large platform. And I'm just going to say it. And I, it's scary to me because the average person maybe doesn't know how to differentiate between truly good advice and someone who actually has the medical training to give that kind of advice and the person who just has a great platform. And that I think is only going to become more and more difficult for the average patient. And as the amount of in information exponentially increases, it's going to be hard to decipher. So the first thing is just compassion to you. If you're suffering with a complex chronic illness and you're trying to navigate and you're so overwhelmed, just be kind to yourself. And what I always say is, at that moment when I made a decision, I took all the stacks of data and I said, okay, at this moment in time, I'm going to make a decision. And the way I make a decision is first, all the head knowledge, I fill up my head with all the analytical data, but then I drop down into my heart and I literally will sometimes close my eyes and put my hand on my heart and my stomach and say, okay, intuitively, what gives me the most peace? What decision moving forward gives me the most sense of, of rightness in my body? And I'll actually often make a decision from that place because that's the heart centered intuitive place. And again, you use the knowledge. I, I, I read till I was, you know, sick with time spent. So you use the knowledge. It's not like you're ignoring the data, but then with that data, there's still, uh, you have to decide, right? A or B or A, B or C. And then you can go to that heart space. And I feel like trusting your intuition with the ultimate decision is so important because when you have a peace, when you have this sense of like, this is the right way to go. If I make this decision, I will feel good about that direction. Then you never have that regret. And I have lived for 20 plus years with severe side effects from some of the treatments that I got from cancer, the chemotherapy and the radiation. And I've never once, not for one second said, what if I hadn't done that? Because I remember in the moment with that decision, I said, you know what? I'm going to use the best data, make a decision, move forward and never, ever second guess myself because that regret and that rumination, that'll destroy us. And I love to encourage patients to do the same because we may 20 years down the road see, oh, well, we could have done it differently. But if we go backwards and look that way, we ruin our ability to move forward in real time. You know, you bring up a great point. I think that gets overlooked a lot in medicine, you know, patient intuition. You know, we're all we're all built with it. We all have it. And I think you're right. I don't think a lot of us trust it. And, you know, being able to take a moment, step outside of that, like I said, that heart space and really trust what your, your, your gut, not your physical gut, but you know, your, your gut feeling is it telling you 
go about, you know, your treatment. You know, I mean, our job, I feel like, you know, is we're the educators, right? We're here to give you, you know, here's options. And, and at least in my practice, and I know in your practice, you know, it's rarely, it's like, here's the one option, you know, right. we've got plan A, B, C, and D yes. and they're not right or wrong. They're just different. And sometimes it's a function of what people resonate with. Sometimes it's a function of money. Sometimes it's a function of what they're really willing to do. I mean, there's a lot of factors that come into play, but gosh, how do we, how do we better help people trust their intuition? I think people, I, I, I just think of one patient I worked with. She was an older woman who had colon cancer and her doctor gave her actually several treatment options. You know, we could do surgery, we could do chemotherapy, we could do radiation, we could do a combination. And she was so paralyzed in the decision, she made no decision. And she ended up passing away fairly quickly. And I kind of felt that not making any decision was part of what probably led to an earlier demise had she made a decision. So the, the I guess maybe the inability to, to make a decision at all can sometimes be as problematic as, you know, whatever the underlying condition is. Yeah. So this brings up a point, first of all, so, so true. And I think um, that's, and again, as our world becomes so information driven and exponentially increased in information, I think this is only going to get more difficult because the amount of information, our brains aren't going at the same pace as AI and the amount of information coming right. out. So we will never quite be able to keep up with that. So one thing you mentioned with your patient example was, I think, fear. Fear is, and so often, sadly, even in clinics and doctors, they lead with fear, like say osteoporosis, which is maybe not as life-threatening as maybe cancer, but still significant. Someone, all of a sudden, a woman who's 55, 60 finds out they have osteoporosis and they're terrified. They're terrified of falling and breaking their hip and they're living in that no. fear or they're making a decision to do a drug that's may or may not be right for them based on the fear. So back to how do we make decisions, whether it's the doctor creating fear, I don't think that's a good motivator. And I think a lot of us are taught, sadly, to create fear and the pharmaceutical industry does that. Well, if you don't do this, you're going to die and this drug will save you. That's just not a good way to practice medicine. I know you and I don't do that. But also yeah. as a patient, if you know, and you can check in with yourself, you've. I always feel like a way to think about this is expansion versus contraction. And that makes sense to people. So even if you don't know what that means, if you just close your eyes and feel your body and you're thinking about a decision, you feel kind of tight, your stomach is in knots, all those kinds of things, those are somatic um, clues to the fact that you are contracted and you're probably more in fear. But if you feel like, like if we all know those, some of our best friends or maybe our loved ones or our pets, we're with them and we're like, oh, this is so wonderful to see you. Or we give a big hug or those are expansive feelings. And maybe we get an information about a new way to treat mold and it's related to detox. And we kind of like, okay, I can do this. We get that. Uh, so I think expansion contraction on a, on a somatic level can help guide us a little bit. And then if we know that there's a fear there going to that place and trying to find out what the root of that fear is and trying to make a decision that is not based on that fear is another good clue. And then as clinicians, we have to model this. So we have to model creating hope and resilience and options and not fear. And we have to model if we see a patient who's constricted, like that patient you talked about, you know, talking them through, well, what would make you feel better and how could we help you with your decisions and giving them resources? Um, because fear is never a great place to make a decision from. I think that's sort of been the, um, <laughs> I think the backbone, a lot of what I see in social media, you know, I, yeah. I, I don't think anyone, you know, questions that fear sells, you know, yes, you right. people <laughs> enough than anything. It's like, oh my gosh, if I have this, I'm going to die or I'm going to have some horrible illness if I don't do it, then I see, again, unfortunately, people in, in our profession who- Even mold, that, right? We see so many things out there like, oh mold, my gosh, mold's going to kill you. <laughs> mold, Lyme, yeah. cancer. Yeah. I mean, look, there's enough stuff out there to be concerned about. And then certainly we talk about from a preventive medicine standpoint, I mean, there's a lot of things you can do to try and prevent a lot of these things. But when you're in the throes of it, yeah. Uh, again, I, I think you just need to be as a consumer, you need to be very cautious about, you know, who you get your information from. Uh, I, I just, again, I don't want to derail this conversation too much, but I was just thinking about, I remember having a, a, I'll say spirited discussion with another doctor around chelation therapy. Mm -hmm. And this doctor was very adamant that chelation was dangerous and you should never do it. And da, 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 da. And I asked him, I said, well, how many patients have you chelated? He says, zero. I'm like, so you've never chelated a patient in your life, yet you're going on saying about how dangerous it is. He goes, well, I read these articles and dot, dot, dot. 
I'm like, well, again, that's the difference between reading something out of a book and having clinical experience, right? I mean, you know, there's a lot of things we do in medicine that uh, sometimes contradicts what might be in the literature. Sometimes it, 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 it corroborates. But, you know, at the end of the day, our clinical experience is really, I think, what guides us as practitioners to know for you, the patient, what's going to give you the best option, what's going to give you the best opportunity for success. Because having used this, whatever the treatment is, you know, with hundreds or even thousands of patients, you know, we have the experience of understanding, you know, what it might do for you, plus and minus. And again, we can help educate that on that. But, you know, there's just no substitute for experience. Yeah. Yeah, we were just talking about a colleague of ours who we love dearly. It says he always says it keeps you honest to be in practice to actually see you still see patients because the honesty comes from the fact that I think as we're humble in our practice, and I see this in you, and I hope that I'm always exuding this like I know that I don't know everything. I know there are answers and I'm willing to look for them, but that humility and curiosity are actually some of the most powerful things that we can have as healers and clinicians, because then we we realize the limit of our knowledge and we're open to understanding more or to learning from other people. Well, I'll argue that the best practitioners out there are the humble ones, yeah. you know, the ones that are okay to say, I don't know, let yeah. me look it up, let me find out, let me call someone else, because yeah. you're right, I mean, there's there's too much information out there, we are not AI, we right. can't possibly, over the course of our entire career, accumulate everything we need to know about the human body and the practice of medicine, so, uh, and that's what I appreciate about you, I think you're one of the most humble, kind people in our profession, uh, but that that says a lot, right? Because that that that's the way I know you treat other people. That's the way you practice, and uh, and people respond to that. Thank you. Yeah, well, I want to. Oh, I'm sorry. That's all. <laughs> yeah, I want to talk about your documentary. Um, again, I know it's really kind of a lot about your journey as a doctor and a patient. But can you tell us a little bit about what the movie's about, and you know, what are people going to get from this? Yeah. So this literally happened 2021, midst of the pandemic, January 1st, I'm sitting alone in my house, you know, we're all stuck. And I'd been writing the book and it was about to be published. And I thought, you know what, all of a sudden people are on screens. There's a lot more people watching screens and Netflix binging and stuff. Yeah. And I thought, oh, if we want to get this message of hope and healing out, we need to do a documentary. And it's funny, Darren, because I have no clue. I've never done documentary, but I had a dream and a vision. And within a few weeks, we had producer, director, the whole team came together. Within a few months, we had a wonderful investor who invested in the project. So all that came together. And initially, it was supposed to be about environmental toxicity, which you and I both see as such yeah, a yeah. huge elephant in the room, like uh, mold and metals and all these things that are affecting our immune system. So that was the theme. But then as the director, producer really looked at the book, they said, we have to do story because you can talk about environmental toxicity, but unless it's a patient or yourself or someone that you're seeing the journey, it doesn't relate. It's not as relatable. And so we shifted and I was kind of a, a little reluctant at first to, to, you know, share my story. And each time we did a new um, cut of the movie, it got more and more deep and vulnerable. And it ended up following the story of three patients. One I've seen for over 10 years for tick-borne illness, a man who was um, literally 16 years old, was ulcerated his whole entire mouth and uh, was told there's no hope. No one can figure out what was going on. And finally, he got so mistreated by the medical system that from 16 to early 30s, he just suffered. And he had an incredible wife who's also in the movie who supported him, but he was suffering with no diagnosis. And then they came to see me. And as you well know, with these complex chronic we see, and I listened to his story. And I think I was the first one who actually just sat and listened and said, tell me everything. And as I listened, you know, I don't even remember this hardly, but 10 years ago, and I said, you know what, I think I know what this is. And of course it was Lyme disease with co-infections yeah. and that chronic complex. Now you know how that goes, right? But for him to first hear a doctor that finally acknowledged his suffering and gave him hope and then treated him. And he went on, he was told he was infertile, couldn't have children. Now they have two children. Like, And I just feel like so honored to be part of the journey because even back, it was, again, 10 or 12 years ago, I felt like I was just on the cusp of really, really understanding Lyme and chronic infections. And then we follow another patient, um, firefighter who had severe toxicity, as you can imagine, doing burning buildings and the mold and all that, and also had Lyme disease. So two men that had Lyme disease. And then a patient that's a young woman who was around the age that I got diagnosed, actually a little bit older, but in her 30s, so very young with breast cancer. So we follow these journeys of the patient. And what you see is the diagnostic stuff is great, but I think the power there is for them to be felt like they were heard for the first time and that someone's like listening. And this is anyone doing functional medicine is really sitting there creating a space 
for someone to tell their story. And that's where it starts, right? Like we, we listen and literally it's usually in the clinical situation, the history taking, where we usually have a pretty clear idea of where to go. And then we prove it with the labs and the science. So you see these patients actually in their journey, being heard, being understood for the first time and seen. And then of course my journey weaves in there because I had cancer in 25 and then Crohn's disease and then mold related illness. And the big picture is not just that there are ways to heal from these complex things that we're told are incurable. And we talk about autoimmunity and how you can reverse autoimmunity. So the message of functional medicine is core in there, but you see the story and the hope. And at the deeper level, the message that came out was BLT was the acronym. And that's believe in yourself, love yourself and love others and trust your intuition. And again, even as a clinician, we're taught that science and analytical mind is where it's at, which is wonderful. But as we just got done saying, what I find some of the most powerful experiences are when we have experience, which you and I both have, over time that leads to this intuitive sense of the pattern recognition that we see. So we're in front of a patient, we're hearing some of the clues and in our intuitive sense are like a pattern recognition happening. And that happens on a subconscious level with literally millions of data points and is actually proven to be as accurate or more as our analytical mind. So when we combine those in medicine, I think that's where as clinicians, um, we have an incredible ability to find answers to complex and chronic things. Well, I love that, you know, the movie really centers around this message of hope. And I think for people who've been struggling with chronic illness and of course the gaslighting that occurs, mm -hmm. which we know is a very real thing. And, you know, I'll say medical hexing, yeah. you know, especially with cancer patients. I think this is a, a, a common problem you know, when doctors tell you, you know, this is your outcome before, you know, I mean, we don't know what's going to happen. You know, it's our, our best educated guess. But I mean, Bernie Siegel talked a lot about this in his work, you know, that cancer patients would come in and doctors would say, you've got six months to live and almost six months of the day they would die because yeah. that's what their doctor told them. And in their head, right. you know, they kind of built up this story that this is the course of their life. But, you know, none of us know that <laughs> we're not, we're not, fortune tellers, we're not magicians. We, you know, we know that uh, certainly as functional medicine practitioners that, and I say this all the time, it's like, look, you know, we have an intelligent design. It is built into our DNA to heal. That yeah. process is already there. We don't need to tell the body to do that, yeah. but we got to get all the obstacles out of the way that stop that process from happening. And that's, you know, that's your work. That's my work. You know, how do we figure out what all those obstacles are? Yeah. So powerful. And, and like you said, the start is just someone feeling for the first time that, that, that a doctor's listening and that they care. Like that really is, I mean, even in my waiting room, we designed it so that there's real artwork. We bring a wine glass full of water, but it's like this like idea that you matter. You're special. This is not just your white coat kind of place. Like you actually have something important to share and that we come on equal levels. Like I'm not any better than my patients. I'm learning with them. And we come together as partners to kind of create a plan of healing. Yeah. I'm guessing you don't wear a white coat in your office. No, <laughs> I never have. I haven't worn one in years. <laughs> yeah, exactly. exactly. <laughs> yeah. Are there other things in the documentary that are think are important for people to know and why would be worth for them to tune in? Yeah. So one thing that we found in two things that we did screenings in theaters and then in uh, film festivals. And so we got some audiences that gave feedback with Q&A and we weren't expecting this, but two things. Um, one was every medical student, every physician should watch, should watch this. And the way we created the um, the website, you can rent it, you can buy it, you can gift it. So if you watch it as a patient, you're like, oh, my doctor needs to see this. Please, please, please. I would love nothing more than to change the face of medicine by getting more um, doctors and patients to see this and especially conventionally trained or patients who maybe are sorry, doctors or med students who maybe don't know a lot about functional medicine, because there's a deep message in here that there are root cause ways to, to reverse what we used to consider irreversible, like autoimmunity. Right. And so that message is very clearly in there. And then even I just had a colleague who watched it and he's an incredible, compassionate chiropractor. But when he saw the movie, I literally, in one of the scenes, hug a patient. I tell him I love them and, and just like this really warm thing. And that's just who I am. But when he saw that, he said, oh my goodness. And when I saw that, I thought, well, I could hug my patients. Like it's almost like giving permission. <laughs> like, of course, right? But it was giving permission. So number one is the, the audience of the doctors and opening their minds. So I'm hoping that patients who watch it will share it with their doctors. But number two is... Um, 
this idea that there are answers to complex chronic illnesses. I think so many people right now, especially post COVID, there is so much stroke, heart attack, sudden cancer diagnosis. And you and I know why the immune system has been really um, uh, decreased in its functioning. T cells are, are diminished. And so we're seeing cancer, viruses, even Lyme reactivating more than ever before, and then stroke and heart attack and coagulation issues. And I think you and I understand this and can see the tsunami. But the average patient out there is like, oh my gosh, so-and-so just had a stroke. So-and-so just got a, a, a fatal cancer diagnosis. And they're seeing this exponential increase in complex chronic illness, especially post-COVID. And they're puzzled. They're like, what in the world is going on? And again, you and I can kind of see the forest through the trees of the patterns that are creating this. But in that confusion and overwhelm, my hope is through this documentary to give hope that even in the midst of the most difficult diagnoses and the most complex things, that there are answers and that you can find, we talk a lot about uh, finding a functional trained doctor like you or like me or like anyone out there that's in those worlds and just really sharing that message that there are. We even have a neurosurgeon for the Denver Broncos who's very conventionally trained, but he realized functional medicine with these post-concussive football players that he needed to know functional medicine because if they just had a concussion, they were fine, but they had a concussion and underlying Lyme disease or mold related right. illness. Right. And of course you and I know this, there's even a good a published article that shows the difference between the classical concussion and those who have an underlying condition. So he saw in his world, in order to heal these football players, he had to go to root cause. And so in that movie, in the movie, you basically see that there is hope. We just have to go to the deeper level. Well, I know people are going to be excited to see it. So we'll drop a link in the show notes for the movie. I believe it's drpatientmovie.com. Yes. Yeah. Drpatientmovie.com. And then I also want to drop a link for your book, Unexpected. Again, I think it's just a, a great testimony to your your will and fortitude. And it's just a great you know hero journey of success of how you overcome. Like I said, you, I think you just, you kind of skirted over some of this, but you know, it wasn't just breast cancer. Yeah. It was Crohn's disease and mold illness. I mean, you got hit with you know quite a few things that, you know, make most people very, very sick, but you were managed to come through it. And that comes out in the book. And mm -hmm. I think, you know, people would be very inspired, encouraged to read that as well. So we'll drop the link in for your book as well. And I would just encourage people to check out both because again, your story is just a, a great story and uh, it's just incredibly inspiring. Thank you so much. And thank you for having me on. It's just always a joy to talk to you and to share medical knowledge and inspiration with all of the people out there listening. All right, well, thank you so much. You're welcome.